Okay. As you already know, sit-down dinners at Canterbury School date to its founding in 1915. Nelson Hume, Canterbury's first headmaster, was a stickler for formality and good manners. His dining room was outfitted with the best of everything. From furniture, to table linens, to the china and silverware. From opening day on September 30, 1915, until the early 1940s, maids and then Filipino waiters served all sit-down meals. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's right, 21 sit-down meals a week. Formal attire, which meant the boys were required to wear a dark suit. For many years, approximately 1919 to the mid-1950s, Mr. Brody, and you can see his portrait in the Brody room on the wall, he was what you might call the director of the dress code. If he deemed that a boy was violating the dress code at breakfast, lunch, or dinner, he had no problem sending the student back to his room to correct his sartorial offense. Shortly after the outbreak of World War II, the Filipinos left Canterbury's employ and enlisted in the war effort, never to return. Nelson Hume, who was an expert at improvising when calamity befell the school, declared that students would replace the former waiters. The students probably weren't too happy to assume their new duty, but they knew better than to argue with Dr. Hume, who ran his school with an iron fist. And so from the early 1940s until today, and this very night indeed, Canterbury has continued the tradition of student waiters. The system of 21 sit-down meals a week ended with the start of the 1969-1970 school year when sit-down breakfast was abolished and replaced by a cafeteria-style meal. In the fall of 1969, I started at Canterbury as a third former. Although I was a day student, I was still required to wait 14 meals a week for a one-week shift. My form mates and all fourth formers, we waited tables. Fifth formers set tables and sixth formers were exempt from any dining room duties at all. I remember that the academic day came to a full halt so that the entire school could eat lunch together. Like today, we were all assigned to a table. And in those days, assignments changed every week. If we were not assigned to wait on a table, we hung out in the common room of what is now Duffy House until someone pressed a small button that rang a bell that signaled we could enter the dining room, now the Duffy art rooms and the gallery, but not before the faculty entered. And prior to the meal, the faculty sat or they stood near the bench that lines the north wall of Duffy Common Room. When the bell rang, the faculty processed in, they took their place at their table, and the students followed. At lunchtime, waiters ate before the meal in a small room located one floor beneath the art rooms. That's where the cooks and I use that word very loosely, prepared meals. They were experts at cooking mystery meat and covering it with a dark brown sauce that they thought would make it edible. Today, the food that Shannon and Frank and Dan and Brian prepare for us, believe it or not, is infinitely better than what Horace and John, the cooks in my day, prepared for me and my schoolmates. Shortly before the start of a meal, lunch or dinner, the kitchen staff placed the food into two dumb waiters that elevated the provisions up one floor where they were ready for distribution to the waiters. 
I never liked eating in that small room. I found it really creepy and very scary. It was like eating in a dark, dingy basement full of cobwebs and the smell of mold and mildew. We brought the food out on brown oval trays like waiters do today, balanced the tray on our wooden waiter stand, and then placed the platters and bowl of, bowls of food in front of the teacher in charge of the table. The teacher served the meal, assisted by a sixth former who sat to the teacher's immediate right or left. Once the main course and the side dishes were heaped onto a plate, the plate made its way all around the table, passed from student to student until it made its way to its final destination. No passing the plate across the table, never. We waited to eat until the teacher began his meal, always. Wearing white jackets, we waiters stood by our wooden stand and waited for our next instruction. Perhaps the table needed more meat, more potatoes, more milk. Yes, they served milk at meals in those days. If the kitchen had run out of food, we waiters, like hunter-gatherers, scavenged nearby tables for whatever food the occupants hadn't consumed and brought it back to our table with a sense of pride and accomplishment. Extra servings were offered to six formers first, and then to fifth formers, and then to fourth formers, and then maybe to third formers. But rarely did those additional servings make their way to third formers. And there was no delivery, food delivery service like Jimmy's in those days. Sit-down dinners ran the same way, with a few exceptions. For example, many of the faculty wives joined their husband for this sit-down dinner. With very few exceptions, no faculty children were allowed in the dining room. In fact, when I was in seventh and eighth grade, my father, who had taught at Canterbury from 1960 until 1990, had to ask permission of then headmaster Walter Sheehan for me to attend a sit-down dinner, usually on a Sunday. It was my father's way of introducing me to the culture of the school. Promptly at 6 p.m., that, that little bell rang. Faculty wives entered the dining room first, followed by their husbands. And then we students headed to our assigned tables. Another exception was that waiters often ate after dinner. Not before, but on a rare occasion, with. If we ate, the meal, if we ate after the meal, then who was going to serve the waiters? Would we dine cafeteria style? No. The solution lay in the last announcement after dinner when the head proctor called out the name of the waiter's waiter. The boy who had perhaps behaved badly earlier in the day and was now going to serve his punishment by waiting on the waiters. When his name was revealed, Johnny Jones is waiter's waiter. Students erupted in laughter. From the early days of the school's founding, students joined the faculty after sit-down dinner in the headmaster's quarters for coffee, tea, and yes, even a cigarette. That tradition continued until the early 1960s when the headmaster's house was built on the top of the hill. After that, faculty and students gathered in what is now Duffy House Common Room for this post-sit-down ritual. No cigarettes for the students this time. Faculty wives poured coffee and tea, which caused some controversy because the women's liberation movement was beginning to gain traction. Eventually, a few male faculty members shared in the pouring duty. Soon, cafeteria-style lunches replaced sit-down lunches. As the years have passed, the number of sit-down dinners has dwindled from seven a week to four to three to two to now one. Today, I feel that waiters sometimes seem put upon for having to wait just one meal a week. I hope that after hearing my talk, you realize just how easy you have it. Although times have changed and sit-down dinner may have lost much of its formality, its purposes are essentially the same. To bring the community together, to teach table manners, 
and for students to meet other students they would not otherwise meet. Canterbury students have participated in sit-down meals for a hundred years. In fact, a bell still heralds the beginning of the meal, and we still have after-dinner announcements. Be proud that you are part of this tradition, and thank you for listening.